Hello Covenant family, this is Pastor David Kling. Happy Independence Day weekend. I'm so excited to get to worship with you uh, this weekend and to bring our country to God in prayer. We've been through so much as a nation this year and it's a wonderful opportunity as we celebrate our nation's birthday in 1776 uh, to pray for our country together as a church. I'm here today um, at the Huntsville Madison County Veterans Memorial and it's a real privilege to be able to remember those who have risked their lives to preserve our freedoms as a nation. Uh, one of the most important freedoms we have is the freedom of religion and we're exercising that freedom today whether you're in our church service in our sanctuary or worshiping at home. Uh, we're gonna have a wonderful service uh, celebrating our, our, our faith in Almighty God and also uh, coming together through the sacrament of communion for those of you worshiping at home. So I encourage you to gather the closest thing you have to bread and to juice in your home so that you can celebrate communion as a family later on in today's service. But first, we'll go to our time with our children. See you there. <laughs> I'm here in my backyard with my set of bagpipes and I can't play them very well but when I as I was growing up my dad taught me how to play this piece which is called the chanter and my dad took bagpipe lessons from when he was 10 years old and he still takes lessons he still plays with a bagpipe band he's still learning and um, growing up we would go to all the parades my dad would leave the Canada Day Parade. He would lead the Independence Day Parade. He would do the Christmas Parade, the Veterans Parade, Memorial Day. It was so exciting to grow up and to be celebrating so many things um, and have my dad lead the parades, whether on his own or with his pipe band. And um, bagpipes are really cool. And even though I can't play them, I still could be there. I could still participate and I could still enjoy it. And you know, this weekend we're celebrating um, Independence Day and yesterday as a Canadian I celebrated Canada Day which is um, really fun growing up we did a lot of Canada Day parades but you know I was thinking about what we can all do this weekend even if we can't lead a parade and play bagpipes we can be praying for our country and we can pray that God would bless us and keep us and we can pray and thank God for people who have fought and defended our country for people who are leading um, for our for each other in our country and we can ask God that he would continue to guide us and keep us um, and whatever lies ahead for our nation and for Canada and so I leave you with um, take a, taking a look at these it's really cool this is a long pipe and this is what makes the sound come out here and this is just fun decoration all right I hope you guys have a great week wherever you are. Bye now.
hope you're having a wonderful Independence Day weekend wherever you are with your family today. And I love this holiday. I love the 4th of July. Ever since I've been a little boy, I've loved parades. Getting to go with a picnic blanket or a folding chair or as a little child being on my dad's shoulders to watch the parade go through downtown. Uh, I remember in Oklahoma seeing floats and fire trucks and police cars with their uh, flashing sirens. And then when we moved up to Pennsylvania, that was wonderful because all the little towns and villages that have history going back to the Revolutionary War when we celebrated the first Independence Day in 1776 and uh, getting to be a Boy Scout and uh, marching in the marching band with my French horn uh, to get to uh, celebrate together what it is that makes us a country. But I'll never forget, uh, just a couple years ago, a wonderful 4th of July parade that my family uh, participated in in uh, St. George Island on the Panhandle of Florida. We had gone down to St. George Island for an extended family vacation and I was there, uh, my dad and mom were there, my brother, my sister-in-law had driven up, and of course, Allison and little George. He was about two years old at the time and just loving every second of being on the panhandle. But we were going to be there during the 4th of July, and this was really special because the island had all kinds of festivities planned for the week. But the thing that everyone said, make sure you don't miss, was the 4th of July parade. They said that the entire town, everybody on the island turns out for the 4th of July parade. So Allison, and you guys know Allison, she's the best. She knows how to get the best and the most fun out of any situation. So she said, this parade is gonna be incredible. So we're all gonna get dressed up in our 4th of July finery. She had uh, bought and packed special 4th of July uh, uh, outfits for every member of the family to wear for a 4th of July picture. So we were all wearing our white polos and different uh, red, white, and blue uh, shorts and hats, and we really looked great. We were ready to really celebrate our country. We were dressed and pressed for our nation's birthday. But we show up to the parade and we realize that we're a little bit overdressed. We look to our right and everyone there 
is wearing cut-off blue jeans and a big oversized athletic shirt. We look to our right and we see that everybody is wearing their bathing suits and has big uh, beach towels wrapped around their shoulders. We look across the street and we see there is a little, there's a gang of little children and they've all got super soaker water guns that they've got uh, cocked and ready to go. What was going on? Well, then we hear the sirens and the bells of the fire truck for St. George Island, the fire engine, and it's coming down the main street and the firemen have all got huge water guns themselves. In fact, they have put a, a whole a pickup truck of firemen with an entire pickup bed, a pickup truck bed full of water, and they're sloshing the water out on everybody watching the parade. The little boys and girls have their water guns, and they're all firing at uh, every float. It's a non-stop 4th of July water gun fight. It was the most fun we've ever had at a 4th of July parade. It certainly wasn't too hot with everybody uh, getting wet. But it was just a wonderful moment where for um, just an hour, we were all together. My family and this little town on this beautiful island, all of us soaking wet, celebrating life as a community. And it's important to take these moments, to take these special moments of laughter and fun, uh, even surprise, that pull us out of the day-to-day, -day, that remind us that with all of the challenges that we are facing as a country right now, that there is something good, something special, and even something sacred about being a citizen of our country. It's times like these that remind me about our nation being holy ground. That's been the theme of our whole uh, sermon series during this last month. Talking about how can human beings who are sinful and broken and do all sorts of things that we should be ashamed of, how can sinful people like us meet with a holy God in his house, in his sanctuary? And what we see in the Bible is that it's not just America that's in the palm of God's hand. It's all the nations. He's got the whole world in his hands, like we heard sung two weeks ago in worship by our soloist. Because the day is coming when all the earth will be holy ground and every nation will be a holy people. And I want to read you that story as we celebrate the birth of our nation and as we bring our nation to the throne room of God in prayer this special weekend. As we look at the end of this sermon series, at where we're all headed, uh, the final act in the Bible, in the Holy Scriptures, when God shows us what's coming up in the book of Revelation, chapter 21. The Apostle John has a vision of what it's going to be like on the last day, the day of judgment, the day of resurrection, when all the dead will be raised. And he writes in chapter 21, that then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. 
they will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. I love reading that special promise for us in Scripture, that the day is coming when all the earth will be holy ground, and when every nation will be a holy people. And that includes us as Americans. It's powerful to see all the different themes that we have looked at over the last month, learning how a holy God can meet with a sinful people are all brought to an exciting conclusion in this passage of Scripture. The passage opens right where we started, with God creating the heavens and the earth. But now God has made a new heavens and a new earth, John says. And most important of all, he says that there was no longer any sea. If you remember where we started off in the book of Genesis, the first thing that God has to do to make holy ground, uh, a place where human beings and where all life can flourish, is to re restrain the life-snatching, deep, dark waters of the primordial sea that were covering over the dry land in the book of Genesis chapter 1. God builds a vaulted ceiling, like the ceiling in our sanctuary, to hold back these deep, dark, uh, anti-God waters and to make, protect a sanctuary, a planet, uh, an ecosystem where life can flourish and give glory to God. In the book of Genesis, God restrains the deep seas, but here in the book of Revelation, the good news is that once the dead are raised, God does away with the sea altogether. The sea is no more. All of the evil and darkness, the chaos, all the injustice in the world is wiped away. And it's symbolic, a representative of the deep dark waters are also wiped away. Instead, there's a new holy city, a new Jerusalem. And the word that uh, the Apostle John uses here is it says that the Lord tabernacles with his people. And that goes straight back to our second sermon, looking at the book of Leviticus, when the tabernacle, the special mobile home tent of a sanctuary, was opened up so that the priests just one person, just once a year, could enter into the flaming presence of God in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle sanctuary, and there pray for the people who can't pray for themselves. To pray for the sins of the nation so that the nation could be wiped clean 
and to continue to receive fellowship with God. Well, now in the book of Revelation, when heaven has come down to earth and the sea is no more, we hear that good news that I was saying, that all the earth is holy ground and that every nation is a holy people. Now God himself is tabernacling, is dwelling with the people, and every person has access to him. It says that God is going to wipe away every tear rather than destroying us with his flaming presence. It's going to comfort us once we have been wiped clean by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, it says, which is the temple. The next thing that we see is that uh, there has been total transformation. Just like we looked at in Second Mile um, in the Terry Heights neighborhood, one of the only neighborhoods in the whole South that has transformed uh, their demographics over the last uh, 30 years. It's been an act of God, a miracle of community development, and that uh, something strange, something holy happened in that neighborhood. In the same way, all the nations are going to be transformed. Uh, the word that we read for nation here in the book of Revelation is actually the Greek word ethne. That's the where we get the word ethnic, ethnicity in uh, English. So what the Bible is telling us is that every ethnicity, every nation, every race, every language, and every culture will be transformed will have the strange and holy experience of being carried into the presence of God and then to bring all that is good into God's presence from that nation, that ethnicity, that race, that culture, and that language. What we see is what we learned about last week, that on holy ground, the rejected becomes the selected. We don't have a perfect country. It's a wonderful country, a country that I love very dearly. But no country is perfect in the eyes of God. No people is perfect in the eyes of God. Next to the glory, to the light, to the perfection of God, we are all sinners in need of a savior. And that's what's going to happen on that last day. Once God has made all the earth holy ground, once he has brought heaven itself into our presence so that God himself can tabernacle and dwell among us, he is going to cleanse us and purify us. It says that the doors of heaven, the doors of the new Jerusalem, will be open all the time. They won't have to be kept shut against uh, people who would do something evil. They won't need to restrain crime because we won't have anything to fear. There will be no night for thieves and robbers. Instead, there will be eternal light coming not from the temple, but from the presence of Jesus Christ in our midst. And so we see that uh, prayer fulfilled from King Solomon when he opened up the first temple in the first Jerusalem. His prayer that the temple would be the place when every race and ethnicity and a nation of the world would be able to come into the presence of God to be transformed. That is finally and fully realized in the book of Revelation. And what we see is the 4th of July parade to end all parades. It's an Independence Day parade. As the image that John shows us is of every nation, every language, every culture, every tribe, all streaming in to the gates of the New Jerusalem. And it says that what they bring with them, almost like huge floats, shining, flashing fire trucks full of honor and of glory. 
says that they're led, the uh, kind of mascot, the kind of uh, drum major at the head of the parade are the kings, the presidents of the earth. And they are bringing their glory in, leading the parade into God's presence, celebrating Independence Day. Not independence from uh, King George or Great Britain, like we celebrate as a country this weekend. But rather, an Independence Day that celebrates being set free from the powers of sin and death. Independence from the Prince of Darkness. Independence from all of our past that would prevent us from getting into heaven. All of our mistakes that would separate us from the presence of God, that would exclude us from holy ground. All of the griefs and sorrows, all the tears and sickness, that we are independent, we are free of all of this. And that a new nation, a new Jerusalem is being inaugurated. The first birthday of an infinite number of the new heavens and the new earth where there is neither sadness nor sorrow nor mourning nor crying but life everlasting. Where we can walk by the light of the Lamb and drink from the fountains of eternal life, hearing the word from heaven saying, it is finished. I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. I have called you here so that I could be your God and so that you could be my children. I think about that first Independence Day all those years ago in 1776 when uh, the Declaration of Independence was written and when uh, the Continental Congress decided to separate from Great Britain. And it was a crazy thing. We were among the smallest nations of the earth fighting against one of the largest, one of the most powerful. But our founding fathers knew that it was a project that could not succeed without the help and grace of Almighty God. John Adams, the second president of the United States and uh, one of the most important founding fathers in the years of the Revolutionary War, he wrote a letter to his wife, Abigail. The Declaration of Independence had just been written and he wrote saying that this will be one of the greatest epochs in American history. It will be celebrated for years to come with loud noises, uh, shooting off muskets in salute, fireworks, by feasts, by partying, by dancing, by 4th of July water gun fights with the local uh, fire truck and children wearing bathing suits and families getting together to celebrate about what unites us, about what we have together, about our shared future as a country. But he also said that it should be a day of solemn worship before Almighty God. That's because our founding fathers knew that to embark on the project of creating a new nation was to write ourselves into the story of Scripture. The good news that the day is coming when all the earth will be holy ground and where every nation will be a holy people. That's something that we can't do by ourselves. Just as this nation was founded by the grace of God, we must continue by the grace of God. As we face so many challenges together as a country in this year, uh, 
public health challenges, political challenges, and of course the important uh, work of racial reconciliation and racial justice. As we face all these things, we must remember the words that uh, John tells us in the book of Revelation, that on that last day, we are going to carry with us all of our glory and all of our honor as a nation. What will that look like as Americans? We will all be together. The work that we do now as a country to come together, to work for justice, for love, for truth, for freedom, this work will last forever. It is part of the glory and the honor that we will carry in to the gates of the new Jerusalem. We will come not as individuals, but as members, as citizens of a nation. A great nation that God has blessed before, that he will bless again and that our Founding Fathers knew that we would need to pray for every day. As we pray together for our country, for our fellow countrymen and countrywomen, we are engaged in work that will carry on into eternity, into that great Independence Day uh, parade, as we declare our independence from death, and our allegiance to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, who has called me and you by name to love one another as he has loved us. Let's worship the God who washes us clean from sin and death and welcomes each of us onto his life-changing, world-transforming holy ground. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. It's such a privilege to get to uh, remember the things that bring us together as a nation and also to pray for our country. So uh, during this time of offering, we remember that we give not just our finances, but we give our lives to God, just as so many have given their lives for the sake of our freedoms and our country. Um, during this time of offering, I encourage you to pray and reflect, but also use this time to gather the closest thing to bread and to juice in your home so that you can celebrate the Sacrament of Communion uh, with me. Following offering, uh, today's offering, I'll lead us in the words of the Lord's Supper. So gather those elements together as uh, we listen to this song. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, everything we have belongs to you. We are so thankful for this nation, God, and we put it in your hands and ask that you would continue to shed your grace on our country. We pray, Lord, that you would receive uh, these tithes and these offerings and that you would also prepare our hearts to receive your holy sacrament of communion. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
This is the perfect way to conclude uh, my sermon series about holy ground at the Lord's Supper, at the Lord's table. This table does not belong to us. It doesn't belong to me or to Covenant Presbyterian Church because what we recognize in this sacrament is that this table is holy ground. This table belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ and all who place their trust in him are welcome here. You may be watching this and this may be the first time in your life that you are committing yourself, that you uh, are signing up for Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. And you are welcome. This table is for you. You may have placed yourself many times in the hands of your Lord. And this is another moment. This is a time to come once again and to recommit yourself to the uh, life-saving grace of Jesus Christ. All of us are welcome here, all who claim him as Savior and Lord. So let's come to this table together. Heavenly Father, we are not worthy to come to this table. The sins of our heart, Lord, prevent us. And yet, by your grace, by the life-transforming sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, whose blood washes us clean and gives us a second chance, we are bold to come here. We take a moment of silence, God, to confess our sins. Thank you. Thank you for the incredible gift of new life in Jesus Christ, for the gift of a second chance to follow you again. We dedicate ourselves to you now, Lord. We ask that you would hear us as we pray together your son's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It was the night he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and giving thanks, he showed it to his disciples, and he broke it, saying to them, This is my body, broken for you. And in the same way, he took a cup, and showing it to them, he said that this cup is the new covenant sealed in my own blood for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's begin by taking the bread together. This is the body of Christ broken for you. now the cup. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. And let us pray. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful gift, Lord Jesus. We love you so much. Send your Holy Spirit to equip us for your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
And now, let us pray together. God of all creation, you parted the waters and called forth land and life and nations and peoples. And mercifully, you have sustained life these many years. We thank you for the gift of our lives and the livelihood that we share together as a community and a nation of peoples among all of the nations of this earth. Teach us how to love each other and to care for each other. Let us be a nation of people who seek to be like your son, Jesus, who loved even his enemies and gave his life even for them. Every week, Lord, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. Usher in your kingdom. Wipe away all of the sin and evil, the pain and suffering, the injustice and wickedness of this passing world. Replace it with your holy kingdom a place where people from every nation under the sun will become one and worship you in spirit and in truth. And let it begin in our hearts, Lord. Turn our hearts away from the idols of our age and back to you and you alone. Soften them so that we may accept our enemies as our brothers and sisters in Christ and teach us how to love one another. We pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me for this special Independence Day weekend uh, worship service. Uh, we have resources if you'd like to continue to talk about today's service. Perhaps have a little discussion with your families in your home. Or call a friend who also watched the sermon to talk about it. We've got discussion questions on our blog, on our website, and that link is here on the screen. Just go to our blog or check out your worship email, and those discussions are right there for you. Next week is a really special worship service. We've got one of our wonderful missionaries, Ben Mathis, from Mission Hope, who will be presenting our sermon both live in our sanctuary, and we've got a video that we'll share with you um, from the comfort of your homes. But Ben Mathis is actually retiring, so this will be his final sermon that he shares with us. Uh, and I encourage you to please do watch or come in person uh, next week so that we can uh, express appreciation and enthusiasm for the ways that Ben Mathis has served the kingdom of God over his long and wonderful career as a missionary. You're a missionary wherever you are. You've got something to do for our nation and for the kingdom of God that no one else can do right where you're at. So let's celebrate that and send each other off together now saying the words of our charge. Wherever we go, God has sent us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. He has a purpose in our being there. He has something he wants to do through us wherever we are. Now go forth with the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.